All right, good morning. Go ahead and get started. Uh, my name is Lauren Reese. I direct the Environmental Change and Security Program here at the Wilson Center. It's my pleasure to welcome you to today's event on improving early warning for uh, climate security risks in the Pacific. It's an honor to be hosting our distinguished panel today. Thank you, President Tong, Admiral Zunkoff, and John Wood for being with us today. Uh, for those of you who haven't visited the Wilson Center before, I'll give you a quick word about where you're sitting. Wilson Center is the living memorial to President Wilson. He was the only president to have a PhD, and so instead of giving him a monument on the mall, Congress gave him a think tank. And so our mandate is to bridge the worlds of policy, practice, and research. The Environmental Change and Security Program does this at the intersection of environment, health, and security, and has been doing so for 25 years. Uh, we're lucky to have Roger Polwardi today here to frame the discussion with some opening remarks. Uh, Roger is a senior scientist in NOAA's Physical Sciences Division. He is a lead author on assessments for the IPCC, UNISDR, UNCCD, and the U.S. National Climate Assessment, an advisor on early warning and adaptation to national and international agencies, including the UN, the Organization of American States, and the Inter-American Development Bank. Roger has been a long time leader in institutionalizing interdisciplinary approaches to program design. He helped design and lead widely recognized interdisciplinary programs, including NIDIS, the Regional Integrated Science, Sciences and Assessments Program, and the Jeff Mainstreaming Adaptation to Climate in the Caribbean Program. Following Roger's remarks, Sherry Goodman will facilitate a discussion with our esteemed panel before opening the, uh, the floor up to questions from all of you. We are lucky to host Sherry here as, at the Wilson Center as a senior fellow in ECSP and our Polar Institute, a former Deputy Undersecretary of Defense for Environmental Security and staff member on the Senate Armed Services Committee. Sherry is a longtime leader on environmental and energy issues, national security, and public policy. She's also a senior fellow at CNA, where she was previously vice president and where she founded the Military Advisory Board. I'd also like to note that in addition to all that Sherry and Roger do to inform actionable and effective policies in this arena, they're really actively encouraging and mentoring emerging leaders in the field, which I think is uh, critical to sort of fostering um, progress down the line. So I want to thank them for that and welcome Roger to the floor. Thanks, Lauren, and welcome, everyone, distinguished guests. We're very fortunate to have these three stellar people who represent a lot of things that are going on, not just in the Pacific region, but how they teach us how we might adapt in a changing world. And you'll hear from Sherry. Sherry and I are engaged in an effort to begin to understand what disruption really means, what extremes really mean in the context of security, and how that actually feeds into how we're thinking about building peace. So as you will hear, and as people in this room know, uh, the Pacific Islands are certainly experiencing issues of food security, human security, energy security from supply and infrastructure, to issues of territorial integrity as well. Many of you are quite aware of the impacts post-World War II on migration and movement of people in that region. But there's something more important, the issue and the ideas of Ohana, that of the family that in fact, they have a lot to teach us about how to work together and how to be partners and how to help provide lessons for the world. So when we deal with things like climate extremes and variability in the Pacific, yes, there are trends in sea level rise. You'll hear about those you know, trends and um, certainly in hurricane intensity. And there are also issues surrounding El Nino, the El Nino events. There are ceremonies in Samoa that happen every four to seven years that are locked into the annual cycle. It's so embedded in the nature and practice of what people do. So they're serving as a way to help us understand the dynamic character of climate-related security risks, and it means that the knowledge acquisition and the management that is needed is an ongoing process. There's no one time, you know, as we all like to say, perfect planning is a figment in the mind of the planner. There's learning over time. There are efforts to engage a variety of people, but most importantly, why we're having this and why we have the gathering and thinking through the problems we were just talking about and the opportunities is, well, what structures do we then build or improve to get this organizational coordination that's needed to act? Throughout the Pacific, there are issues concerning livelihood risks that are of the kinds I just mentioned. There are also technical uh, considerations and technical considerations relative to armed groups. But we're not making the case here that 
climate, climate events lead to conflict. We're basically saying they certainly exacerbate the conditions and we're trying to get ahead of those. The exploitation of the aftermath of rapid onset disasters actually is an entry point for how relief becomes a tool in security issues. So where are we? We're trying to improve the response capabilities of na for natural hazards, the changing environments of freshwater, fisheries, uh, disaster risk reduction, maritime security, and the domain awareness that goes with that. And the link across those are the robust understanding of extreme events and something else that's happening in the region the great power strategic competition that is going on. Everything from the Belt and Road Initiative to the long history of the United States and the region. And that's something we'll, we'll talk about. But our most important issue here is trying to get at the science and diplomacy, the peace building, what facilitates cooperation that helps us get across uh, before, during, and after times of environmental stress. To do that, we have to demonstrate that we know something about those changes the importance of assessing the assumptions behind what we do, as um, Admiral Zunkoff likes to remind us, the assumptions behind what we do is actually the things that create the path that enable or constrain long-term risk. We're encouraging the refinement of ideas about the causes and dynamics of conflict that in turn lead to better design interventions and promoting the participation of co local communities in conflict prevention, especially women and marginalized groups. But the most critical thing we're about to hear when it comes to the risks and the things we're facing and the issues that um, Mr. Tong reminds us of is there's triage. We have to begin to choose. And so the coordination and coherence among relevant groups, including the security intelligence, the military, trade, private development, humanitarian and peace building groups are paramount. How we deal with extremes over time, how we learn from them and how we link the short-term responses to those, to the long-term needs of a resilient Pacific Island region as our partners and the purveyors of new ideas in adaptation is tantamount to this study. So Sherry, if I can ask you to come up and introduce our speakers. So thank you very much. That's the subtext to the issues that we're trying to address. The goal here is to understand conflict, but to get to peace building. Thank you. Okay, good morning. Good morning. Okay, all right. Some people are awake <clears throat> and we have coffee. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here with you all this morning. I am Sherry Goodman and I have the privilege this morning of introducing our distinguished guest and moderating the discussion, which will also include you here in the audience and those following uh, along online as well. So uh, it's, it's a great honor and, and privilege to be here. This uh, discussion this morning caps a, a workshop that we had yesterday um, involving our distinguished leaders and others to really get at some of the core challenges that Roger laid out in his remarks. And thank you, Roger, for your partnership. And also let me thank Lauren and the excellent team here at Wilson for their great work. Uh, Amanda here, already hard at <clears throat> work, and many emerging leaders among us who have stepped up to help make uh, this day and future efforts possible. Uh, we encourage that, uh, we want to cultivate it, and we're very proud uh, of the work that uh, you all are doing. Uh, so the common theme, uh, I would say, for this discussion we're having this morning is the vision that our three leaders and speakers have brought in their own work uh, to helping us better understand the challenges we face uh, in the Pacific region and also being able to turn that foresight into action. Uh, because what we're engaged in here is understanding the multiple threat, of the multiple challenges we face in the region and at the same time working to combat those challenges in a constructive, engaged way with partners uh, and allies. And so 
With that, uh, let me introduce our three speakers, and then we'll start our discussion. Uh, it's, uh, we're, we're very privileged to have here uh, President Tong, uh, who's a world-renowned leader in the battles against climate change and ocean conservation. He served three terms as president of Kiribati, um, and he has really been at the front lines of enabling the world to understand uh, what happens uh, as climate is changing the Pacific Island region, but also what impacts will be around the world. And he did this well over, beginning well over a decade uh, ago, uh, when the changes were not as rapid as we see them today. So uh, not only is his uh, country disappearing, uh, but the entire population may need to resettle not as climate refugees, but as citizens uh, who will migrate uh, on merit and with dignity. And that's been an important part of that. His, under his leadership, he created the Phoenix Islands Protected Area, a uh, 150,000 square mile UNESCO World Heritage Site off limits to fishing and extractive industry. Um, and these initiatives and others uh, have made him a real visionary. Now. Admiral Paul Zunkoff, uh, we here, has served as, served as the 25th Commandant of the United States Coast Guard, and I was privileged to work with him in that capacity. And um, he has brought such great leadership and understanding of the, coast, the multiple Coast Guard missions around the world, from law enforcement to illegal fishing, from search and rescue to environmental protection, and many others. I think, how many are there, 11 or 13 more actual official missions in the Coast Guard? There's quite a long, quite a long list. Deployed forces around the world, but very, a great deal of presence um, in the Pacific, uh, also has a lot of experience in the polar regions, uh, where we've also been pleased to work. And he, of course, now makes his home in Hawaii, so he's close to the front lines of our discussion today. Um, and, uh, and, and last but certainly not least, we have Dr. John Wood, who is um, at Indopaycom as the J9 uh, for partnerships. So what does that mean for those of you who don't spend your time uh, doing things Department of Defense? It is the directorate that engages directly with allies and partners in the region, also with the interagency, also on a variety of um, important collaborative agendas that relate to the subject we're discussing today from environmental, environmental security to women, peace and security. And John has made it his personal mission to be a leader uh, in this area and to bring uh, the full weight and force of the goodness that can be had through the Indo-PACOM command on all hazards uh, and civil affairs and to marshal that, and he also has a long and distinguished um, history as a naval, uh, experience as a naval aviator. So we're very privileged, John, to have you here as well. So uh, beginning our discussion, and, and President Tong, if I could start with you, because you, you give <coughs> such a, a vivid um, descriptions that we can all appreciate. Can you share with us um, your sense of what are the greatest challenges facing the region today? And why does it matter for all of us sitting here in Washington uh, when we're bombarded on a daily basis with so many other things going on? Uh, thank you, uh, Sherry. Before I do that, uh, I think it's um, almost incumbent upon me to bless you before we begin. So let me do that. And, uh, but I would also ask you to bless me back. <laughs> so how we do this is I'll say, come to Maori, and he's all he says in return, Maori meaning, may you be blessed, and you simply reply by saying blessings to you too. So let me bless you. Come to Maori. Oh, almost good. <laughs> 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 but uh, let me also begin by expressing how deeply gra grateful I am for the opportunity to come to this place where most things happen. And thank you, Sherry, uh, Roger, and uh, all of you responsible for flying me all the way. It's a long way from where I come from. But I'm so happy, and uh, I want to acknowledge uh, Steve. Steve and I shared many moments in the Pacific um, when Steve was ambassador, and I 
Maybe I should talk about the good things, not the others. But uh, we did some good things, I believe, which remain until the day. Thank you. And of course, uh, one of these is the shipwright agreement with, the, of course, the Coast Guard. And um, uh, Kiribati is a country, it's, uh, it's perhaps one of the largest ocean states. We have a, a huge marine area, 3.5 million square kilometers of ocean. But just 800 square kilometers, 800 square kilometers of, of land. So you can imagine how spread we are. We are, we're the only country with the distinction of being in the four parts of the world, in the north and the southern hemisphere, in the east and the west of the international dateline. So we are in the center of the world. But against that, we have this huge challenge because being an island, we are low-lying. All of our islands are atolls, barely two meters above sea level. And that's, too, that's a bit generous. And so the challenge we face is the um, climate change. With the projected rise in sea level, we st the, the, uh, the, our survival is very much in jeopardy. And unless we can come up with uh, some very innovative solutions in order to survive, to remain above the seas, and the, the storms, our future is really, I think, is, is very much in question. I have 20 grandchildren, and this is why I am very serious about this issue. It's very personal. But I think it's also about the other grandchildren, not just in Kiribati, because I'm hearing now that um, what is happening with climate change is no longer simply an existential threat for countries on the front line, but for humanity as a whole. And I think this is something that we need all to take into consideration. So climate change is something that we, that I've been working on and that we still have not found a solution to address. Um, in addition to that, we, there, is, there are the ongoing, and I think we touched on this yesterday, and um, I want to share this because right now in my country, Parliament is sitting and it's uh, been, the Speaker has decided to stop Parliament illegally. And this is all over this controversy between, over the Chinese, Taiwanese issue. You know, when, when I came into office, I established relations with Taiwan, with the new government. They changed relations, and the people are upset. So the potential for conflict is there. The potential for conflict with respect to climate change, I think, has already been evident in the, what's happening in, in North Africa and to Europe. It's going to be an issue for us already. Sorry, it's already an, an issue for us, because we have people who are already being displaced, but inevitably, what's going to happen is our people may have to go. If, if our islands go underwater and if we are unable to build resilience. And the question is, where do we go? Who, who is going to accept our displaced people? And so climate change is, I believe, the greatest challenge, not only facing Kiribati, but facing humanity. Let me stop there because I think uh, we can share the, what we, we talked about yesterday. And of course, hopefully, we will have an opportunity to ask questions and yes. answer questions. Let me stop there, Sherry. Thank, Thank you, you very much, mm -hmm. Mr. President. Um, Admiral Z, um, if you would pick up from there on, on having been served you know, on the front lines in the Pacific with the greatest challenges you see we face uh, in the region today. Well, in this, thank you, Sherry, and again, thank you all for, for joining us here today for this discussion, which it really is, uh, and to be interactive. And, and normally I would open with aloha, uh, and people would immediately respond in Hawaii and say aloha, and what happens is they start breathing through their nose and not through their mouth, but for whatever reason, whenever I come to D.C., we're hyperventilating through our mouths, so, you know, just think aloha in the tropical breezes, uh, which is where my mind is at right now, <laughs> questioning my sanity, why I left the mid-80s to, you know, come here at this time of the year. Uh, so, as I see, especially as we're looking at the, you know, the Pacific Island nations uh, that come under a compact of free association, uh, we don't have a national strategy to address this area. Um, and we're at an inflection point right now. If, if climate change is the catalyst where we need to step up our involvement in the region, uh, you know, we've 
politicize this term called climate change. And, and so if we're agnostic to climate change, then we may be agnostic to the needs of these nations. But I think as the president alluded to and as Roger opened up, and without specifically calling out great power competition, um, but I don't have to spell it out for this audience, um, but I see that as the catalyst for change, if you will. Um, and so I'll give you an example first. Uh, I was, uh, did a lot of work in the Arctic, and uh, we, I created uh, the, what's called the Arctic Coast Guard Forum, uh, where we meet with the Arctic Council Nations, and, and I'll zero in on Greenland in particular, and our relationship with the Kingdom of Denmark. Uh, at that point in time, China is already involved in the exploitation of rare earth elements from Greenland as land becomes exposed as, sea ice re as, as the ice fields retreat. Now, the only way to connect various parts of Greenland is by airports. And so China offered to Greenland, that's a self-governed, even though it comes under the protectorate of Denmark, uh, to build three airports, um, commercial airports, if you will. Um, I immediately engaged my counterpart with Denmark and said, this is not a good thing for us, and it's not a good thing for you as a NATO ally. Um, if you use the Sri Lanka, you know, port building, endeavor by China, it says, we will build you a port, but if you can't service that loan, we will take ownership of that and we will own it for the next 99 years. And that was the concern I had with airstrips in Greenland. Uh, it became the catalyst for change for Denmark to provide the loan to Greenland to build these three airstrips. But if you can imagine Greenland being a strategic link and our early warning in ballistic missile defense, and as we're seeing a recurrence of Cold War activity in the North Atlantic. Um, I then shifted my focus to what's happening in the Mid-Pacific. You know, we have the Nine Dash Line. You know, we have the third island chain. And now we have a potential fourth island chain. Uh, and some of you may have been out to the Republic of the Marshall Islands, out to Kwajalein. As you know, that too is a critical link in our national security objectives. And now you have, as we talk about, you know, the Belt and Road Initiative coming through our Pacific Island nation. So take climate change out of the narrative, if you will, and let's insert <clears throat> China into this catalyst for change. Uh, it, we have the compacts that will expire in 2023, 2024 for this region. Uh, we don't have a strategy, but, it, but if we hook it right now to climate change, you know, we, we may let this opportunity pass us by. And I'll go back to 1867. Um, the reason that's critical for me is that's when the Coast Guard first started operating up in the Arctic mm. region because we signed a deal with Russia where we acquired the territory of Alaska for two cents an acre, and it was dubbed Seward's Folly. So fast forward 100 years. Could you imagine in 1967 if Alaska was the home base for the Soviet Union at the height of the Cold War? So, so too many times we, we don't think things through. Uh, we think tyranny of the present, crisis management, <clears throat> uh, but we don't look ahead in five to six year increments. So the challenge that I see, long answer to a straightforward question, is, is what are the stakes here? And, and what is missing from our prioritization of global concerns? And, and so what is missing is we have not adequately focused our efforts on this area. Uh, we had a lot of smart people in the workshop yesterday, and we've addressed a number of initiatives um, that, that do need to be implemented to raise not just awareness. Awareness is great, but if awareness is not followed up with action, uh, then all we have is we are aware that, that China is now encroaching upon our sphere of influence, and that is unacceptable. So, so I view that as the challenge of, you know, this has now entered into the great power competition, if you will, but as you heard, the, these are cultures that affinitize with the values that we have here in the United States. And so we need to respect that culture, uh, and, and we need to continue this longstanding relationship we've had with our Pacific Island nation partners. Well, uh, that, that was brilliant, Admiral Z. And just to uh, reinforce that, imagine, you know, as you said, imagine uh, if, if today we didn't have the Seward's folly that became Alaska and Russia was indeed uh, in what we now know as 
Alaska. So often we suffer from what we called in the military advisory board a failure of imagination, you know, to see uh, what's coming on the front lines. And that's where you've also been so visionary, um, President Tong. But now, John, turning um, to you, since you are there uh, on the front lines at indo -Pacom, and I should note also, John was a um, White House fellow in the 1990s here working for the Secretary of State around the time that the Environmental Change and Security Program got started 25 years ago. Um, and so present at the creation, so to speak, of what's been a, a, a very vibrant set of discussions in, and actions integrating our national and environmental security agendas. And I know that's what you also are very much engaged in. So share with us, if you could, as you see China's uh, increasing presence and influence in the region, how you, you, how you think about the challenges of the region and also then some of the capabilities using the of, of the partnership uh, office that you direct to address them. Well, aloha from Hawaii. I'm sorry I couldn't bring our 80 degree weather here. I have this huge coat I'm wearing. My blood is definitely thinned out. Uh, thanks to Sherry and Roger for hosting the workshop yesterday and this open forum today. I'm, and I'm honored to be on this panel with President Tong and, and Admiral Z. And I see a, a Naval Academy midshipman in the audience, and uh, it's good to see that. Um, it's a long time since I was wore that uniform, but uh, looking forward to Navy beating Army this year in December. <laughs> Any Army guys in the crowd? They're uh, not wearing their uniform. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> anyway, it's great to be here. Um, so I represent Admiral Davidson, who's the combatant commander for the U.S. Indo-Pacific Command. We changed our name last year to reflect the importance of the Indo-Pacific as a lifeline for Indo-PACOM. Mm -hmm. As you know, the Department of Defense carves up the world into our areas of responsibility, and ours is from the Indian Ocean to the west coast of the United States, from the Antarctic to the Arctic, or what we like to say, from Bollywood to Hollywood, and uh, penguins to polar bears. Uh, we have assigned forces, 380,000 uh, strong, and a substantial amount of our hardware and forces are forward deployed west of the international date line. Why do we do that? The tyranny of distance in the Pacific is incredibly long. To get from the west coast of the United States to, let's say, Singapore mm -hmm. is about a month to sail. Um, and in today's environment, that's too long. So we have a lot of assets forward. And with those assets, we can do, we can pressurize the environment to maintain peace and security and do good work with those assets. And I'll, and I'll talk about that in, in a second. Uh, so I do Pacific outreach to Asia and also think tanks and universities and private sector. It's a terrific job. I, I did hard power for 30, over 30 years as a naval uh, fighter pilot. Now I get to do soft power and uh, really liking uh, this, <clears throat> this uh, latest soft power uh, coordination effort, which is why I'm at this panel. So Sherry uh, uh, talked about uh, increased uh, Chinese presence uh, uh, in open source media and scholarly magazines. Everyone can read about some of the pernicious activities China is doing in the South Pacific and throughout Asia, that book diplomacy. Uh, uh, not fostering good governance, undermining some of the values we have. Uh, and, uh, and the Department of Defense is postured to, uh, to continue to be in the Indo-Pacific and provide an architecture with the rest of the U.S. government and our friends, allies, and partners in a way to counter that. And we can talk about that more in, uh, in the future. The, the workshop was concentrated on the Pacific Islands, and I can tell you, Admiral Davidson, it's one of his core interests is to maintain the peace and security in the Pacific Islands from the Federated States of Micronesia and the compact states, which Admiral Z uh, mentioned, all the way down into uh, working with our friends in French Polynesia um, to make sure that the Pacific Islands, uh, uh, we create the, the best environment we can for them. And again, the Department of Defense can do some things. I would like to say that we have a national vision for a free and open Indo-Pacific that was articulated by the president in 2017. 
rearticulated by the Secretary of State, uh, the Vice President in Papua New Guinea, 2018. We have a national defense strategy for that encompasses a free and open Indo-Pacific and Indo-Pacific strategy report by uh, the Office of the Secretary of Defense. And U.S. Indo-PACOM has a free and open Indo-Pacific public strategy. What does that mean to the audience? Well, first, Department of Defense, we like strategies and documents because it helps align our thinking and how we're going to tackle certain areas. And a free and open Indo-Pacific is just that, that it's free, it's open, it's open for trade, it's unencumbered by uh, kind of nefarious activities, that uh, the global commons under the water, on top of the water, in the airspace, in cyberspace, in space, uh, are not threatened and the rule of law prevails. That is our overarching strategy, and you can put that on the Pacific Islands and see that we can tie in a lot of the Pacific Island concerns for environmental security, trafficking in persons, counter-narcotics, uh, illegal, unregulated, unreported fishing, things that matter to the Pacific Island countries. The Department of Defense can help in those areas, and I look forward to exploring how uh, as we move on. Great. Thank you very much, uh, John. That was that was really um, imp that was really valuable, um, and helping us understand how you how Indo-PACOM can integrate uh, the hard and soft power approaches as a way to bolster security. So what we're talking about here is not only pathways by which in environmental change can lead to conflict or instability, but also pathways to peace and cooperation. So, President Tong, you've been, you know, on the front line of helping to uh, advance mechanisms uh, for resilience building in the region. And as we've been focused in this effort on sort of improving our <clears throat> predictive capabilities, uh, better to understand both uh, rapid extreme weather events as well as slow on, more slower onset changes in the form of droughts and other longer-term effects affecting the security of the people, human security and national security in the region. Can you share with us some of the ways in which you think the, the Kiribati and the Pacific Island nations uh, need, need to, uh, are building and, can, and we can work together to advance some of these resilience activities? <laughs> Thank you, Sherry. Quite frankly, I've never found a solution yet, but I keep dreaming of finding the solution. As I said earlier, the, the, uh, we're on the front line uh, with the projected rise in sea level, the increasing intensity of the storms. Our islands, I think, would be underwater well within the century. And so the question is, what options do we have? And uh, I can tell you that when I started struggling with this more than 10 years ago, but I think I've been at this for about almost 20 years now. But the first time I read the reports, the IPCC reports, it, it came, it was very clear to me what climate change is all about. It's all, it's a, because up to that time, climate change was a, an interesting scientific phenomenon. I mean, um, the scientists that were involved it found it very exciting. I'm sure they got a lot of funding because it was an interesting new area of research. But for me, as soon as I read the report, I, it dawned on me very straight away that this is a hugely human issue. And the human dimension of climate change had not been the focus of attention. There was a time when I uh, read an article in the National Geographic, and it's about the polar bears losing their habitat. And so I had been speaking at the United Nations General Assembly. Nobody listened to me. It was all about terrorism. And um, here I quoted this article that the world was worried about the polar bears, but never given any thought to people like us in the other side of the world. And so, it, how do we deal with this? I can assure you it's not easy, emotionally quite stressful, because when you come to think about it, you realize that you're going to lose your home, what it means for the, the people that you're, you're responsible for. What do they do? And I think, and it began to open up new, new challenges, very, very new challenges. And you, and I know that a lot of my colleagues in the region, for quite some time, could not grapple with this because it, it took me a long time to come to terms with the brutal reality that we're going to lose our home, 
And unless we can find adaptation measures to build the kind of resilience needed, we are going to have, we, we will have to go. We would have to be relocated. And so in the process of thinking about solutions, I went and I met the Japanese and I talked to them about building floating islands, you know, and uh, building the islands up. Even today, we, I keep hoping that we can find a solution. Yesterday at the meeting, I said I'd love to be able to go back with a, uh, uh, a credible solution, something that's concrete, something that would ensure that our people have somewhere to go when uh, the, the tides come up, when the storms uh, come. And so the idea of building islands came up. I think it's, it's, it's a logical proposition. And then, but the question is, could we ever mo mobilize the resources to build up all of the islands? My conclusion was that no, we would never be able to do that. So we have to come to terms with the reality that if we are to build the islands, maybe just one or two to ensure that uh, we continue to have the nation of Kiribati, the culture, and the people. Even that, we need to know what really is happening over the next 100 years, because the questions will be, how high do we build the islands? Where do we get the resources to do that? And these have been the questions that I'm afraid I don't have the answers. The concepts are there. I started uh, putting, doing all kinds of things. I, I created uh, with partner countries in the region, Tuvalu, the Marshall Islands, the Maldives, uh, Tokelaus, who are similarly challenged, into a coalition of atoll nations on climate change, trying to find solutions, credible solutions. And uh, up to now, we still haven't done that because the international system continues to grapple and, str and struggle with finding, with addressing emission levels and what have you. We're not focusing on emission levels because even if the, the world, the global community was to get emissions to zero, we would still go underwater. And so in Paris, during the discussions, I said, I directed my people, make sure that, that there is a provision for adaptation. The rest does not really matter to us. And so what do we do? And so the solutions that I came up with, some a bit wild, and as I said, one of them was building floating islands. They would be worth something like a few billion dollars. We don't have the billions of dollars. Building islands, raising the islands, I don't know what it would cost, but it's going to be enormous. We don't have the resources to do it. And I doubt if the international committee is going to come up with this. So I kept looking around. And then I thought, um, uh, John, you talked about cryptocurrency, OK? I've been going around talking about blue bonds, tuna bonds, because we have one of the largest tuna resources in the world. We have a huge, huge fishery. We, uh, but unfortunately, the return to us is only around 10% of the value on the side of the wharf, not in the retail shops. And so I kept talking, trying to get people to be interested in assisting us to get a higher rate of return. Maybe the U.S. can do that. Maybe the U.S. can allow us a free access into your markets. Because if we could that, if we could have that, people will come and can. And so... Sherry, the question is, what, are the, what solutions have you come up with? These are the concepts that I've been talking about. And it's based, there was a concept which I, I started putting together with some people, and it's, it's called Pacific Rising. Instead of sinking, it's Pacific Rising, and this is it. It's building the nation so that we do not lose our, our sovereignty, we do not lose the nation of people, that uh, those people who decide to leave, because we can never accommodate all of the people, some will have to relocate. And for those who do relocate, I'd love to have them in the 50 years from now say there was a country there, and that's where we once belonged. But if we can still have that nation in existence, it would be wonderful. And I think hopefully we can remain a part of the biodiversity of this uh, global community. But uh, just in closing, Sherry, Part of the strategy that I also considered was I accepted the reality, the brutal reality that maybe one day we may have to relocate. Most, many of our people, if not all. But if we do that, 
I don't want our people to be relocated as climate refugees. And so people ask me, so how would you like your people to be relocated? As people who would migrate with dignity. What that means is that it would be a proactive response to what is happening. We don't want to remain victims. We've got to take charge and some measure of control of what's happening to us. And so the idea of migration, migrating with dignity is that we would begin preparing our people to train them to be skilled so that if and when they do go, wherever they choose to do so, they would go as worthwhile citizens, not as second-class citizens. I've been hearing about what's happening in Europe with the migration from, from Africa, and it's not always good. This is not something that I would like to see our people do, because it's not, we've, this is happening not because it's our choice, but because we don't have a choice. And so migration with dignity is something that I've been advocating, and I still do, and it's, uh, it's a process of preparing our people to migrate, wherever they go to, but also to prepare the, the countries to be able to receive them. So it's got to be a two-way process because I understand in talking to people in Germany, from Germany who are now, who have been receiving a lot of these people, and I found that stress is beginning to build up. And I asked them, how, you, how do you feel about people coming? And they said, they're nice people. They said, in the beginning it was okay, but not now. I think it's, it's getting to the stage where it's beginning to be stressful. And so we don't want that kind of conflict arising because of this people who are displaced because of climate change. Thank you. Well, okay, well, that was um, both very heartfelt, very sobering, and I think we all are, um, I know I am, um, or still just personally uh, digesting that since you shared that with us as well yesterday, but it's so, uh, we're not confronted with that reality on a regular basis here. Um, and so it's, I think, important for us to be reminded of, of that. Um, we're going to open it for questions in a few minutes, but if I might ask Paul, you know, in your time in, in service, you were on the front lines of addressing some of this in extreme weather events when at least people had temporarily to relocate. Um, but extend your thinking, because I know you have done that a lot, um, and particularly you've, you've also thought about how to build governance and resilience in the Arctic through the Arctic Coast Guard Forum and other efforts. But help us think through how um, some of those uh, efforts might have application in addressing some of the challenges we're talking about here. Yeah, and like you, Sherry, I'm digesting uh, the president's comments, you know, that this is a, uh, an inevitable existential threat. Uh, and so to your question, though, when, when I look at, we talked earlier about great power competition, um, we never talk about great power cooperation. Uh, and, and what we're confronting here is a humanitarian threat. Um, I remember when I was in command of a ship back in 2000, uh, our relationship with the PLA and the People's Republic of China was at an all-time high after they had forced down a, 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 a P-3 aircraft and then disassembled it. Uh, I was dispatched um, to conduct a search and rescue exercise with the PLA Navy. And they said, well, we can all collaborate and work together when it comes to safety of life at sea type issues. Um, and so what we have here is this is safety of life at sea as the sea encroaches upon the Pacific Island nations. So um, might this not be an opportunity for great power cooperation? Uh, I know China is very adept at building islands, um, and so, and yet at the same time, you look at, you know, two of the world's largest emitters uh, that contribute to greenhouse gases are the United States and China. So this may be a diplomatic window of opportunity. Um, rather than posture every statement in an adversarial tone of voice, um, might this not be an opportunity? Um, to enhance the livelihoods of, of a people that, and quite honestly, you know, environmental refugees, uh, it rolls off the tongue quite easily, but then how do you reestablish sovereignty? 
um, you know, if, if this populace were to relocate in another country, does that country then assume, you know, what was the EEZ of that particular nation, uh, which are right now the richest, most fertile grounds for harvesting tuna? Um, <clears throat> so that, that is, quite honestly, I agree with the, the president. It's unpalatable. Um, and it's not just in the Pacific Island nations. We're seeing the same thing in Alaska. We have 31 villages up there. Um, first Nations, um, indigenous peoples whose livelihoods are threatened, not so much by rising sea level, but by the retreat of sea ice. Um, as we look at a, an opening Arctic, but it's that very same sea ice that serves as a barrier to prevent coastal erosion. So you literally have villages falling into the ocean, and I witnessed that up in Shishmaref um, a little over a year ago. Um, so uh, it's, it's happening not just here, but it's happening worldwide. Uh, the United States, clearly, we, we can't even address our, our, our current state of infrastructure, um, let alone what is happening and what will happen uh, in, in our coastal cities from New York through Miami, Louisiana, San Francisco. Huge challenges when we look at the impacts of climate change. Um, but in this region, you know, we do have an opportunity. Uh, we have different frameworks, and so where do you begin? Uh, we really need to begin with, with a frank and open dialogue, and not just with uh, the People's Republic of China, but with our other allies, uh, particularly Australia, New Zealand, uh, who have considerable influence in this region as well. Um, I think that was really uh, an opportunity for us, and I've seen that in the many disasters that, that I have worked. Um, but with every disaster, and as Tip O'Neill says, as in politics, everything is local. Um, and so it really begins at the local level, and it begins with the resident population um, in the Pacific Island nations. And then we work it up from there. You know, you can't work it from the top down um, and then prescribe, you know, these are the best actions that are in your best interest. It really needs to float from the bottom up. But I, I do view this as a humanitarian crisis, and when it comes to safety of life at sea, Coast Guard, we're it, um, but we're not in the business of saving islands. Um, but certainly, uh, we have a number of search and rescue agreements. We have, an, a, we have a ship rider agreement with China. Um, every year, we send a, a, one of our Coast Guard ships out to the Western Pacific with a Chinese ship rider on it to enforce <coughs> IUU fishing activity out there. It's not an exercise, it's an operation, and we've been doing this for over 12 years. So yes, we do collaborate and cooperate with our other, what are deemed in our national security strategy as peer adversaries, but we also have you know, the opportunity for peer partnership as well. And, and this is a region I think we can close that gap. Very, very well said. Um, thank you, Admiral Z. Uh, John, in the Indo-PACOM, how, how do you use your, the partnership capacity available uh, through your numerous mechanisms from, for example, you now have a NOAA liaison officer at Indo-PACOM, so you've got building interagency capability, and you participate in the actively and lead the Pacific Environmental Security Forum, and there are other um, partnership capacities. Talk about how you can utilize these here to take these soft power approaches to help resilience building and also the improving the predictive capability as we advance our, our tools in this area. Thank you. That's a, a great question and tees up a, a lot of ideas. So Indo-PACOM, as I articulated before, we have a national vision for a free and open Indo-Pacific. I believe that enables all of the U.S. government agencies uh, and galvanize around this concept. So we're working very closely with the Department of Interior. As you know, they are uh, the executive agent, if you will, to, for the COFA states and to run that agreement with the compact states. Department of State, excellent relationship with, uh, excellent relationship with the Department of Treasury and the Asia Development Bank to get that critical uh, financing available. Uh, working with the Department of Commerce, they are in charge of, of commercial services and bring in U.S. investment throughout the world, working with commerce specifically on the Pacific Islands to encourage private sector investment, and then also ensuring OPEC, soon to be IDFC, depending on the budget, um, uh, 
taking their $60 billion of resources that can, that can underwrite risk in the Pacific Islands, again, with commerce and OPEC to encourage that private sector investment. And then internationally working with JBIC, the Japan Bank for International Cooperation, in our, and in Australia, the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade, uh, again, to coordinate private sector investment. At Indo-PACOM, we have 42 liaison officers from 23 U.S. government agencies that help uh, travel not only to bring what those different government agencies can do in the Indo-Pacific Command through the military, but also provide those key linkages to the Department of Treasury, to the Department of Energy, the Department of State, Department of Interior. Um, so it's my job to kind of care and feed for those LNOs and also work at the Deputy Assistant Secretary level at Treasury and Commerce uh, and establish those key lines of communication. Uh, we also have an advocacy program for Congress, so I, I, I run that. As you know, Admiral Davidson will testify a posture statement in February, March. Uh, you should read that. That encompasses our strategy and what we hope to do in the Indo-Pacific. But we also have numerous congressional delegations that come through the headquarters who ask a lot of questions. And, of course, we're there to answer them on what the Department of Defense and Indo-Pacific Command can do in the Pacific Islands and the Indo-Pacific writ large. Uh, again, we're working with our friends, allies, and partners. So you have French Polynesia, New Zealand, Australia, Japan, the United States. Uh, and we're trying to coordinate our activities along these lines of what Sherry just said. One of the ideas yesterday was um, my director is doing a risk vulnerability model for the Pacific Island countries. I know Australia is developing a similar model uh, and other uh, entities is find a common uh, model that we can all share, share information and share activities so we can coordinate not only through the U.S. government, NGOs, think tanks, and our international partners to do the right things in the right places to affect the right uh, outcomes in the Pacific Islands. They're so diverse. Each one uh, is a real <clears throat> separate culture and entity, and it's going to really requires a whole of society approach. So that risk vulnerability model is something uh, that we're working on in my directorate as well. Um, we're working on getting broadband to the Pacific Islands. It enables so much from information sharing, uh, the ability of the Pacific Island states to see and understand and perhaps mitigate their economic zones, as President Tsong said, uh, huge economic zones, very little land masses to, to help them understand what's going on. And that would help regulate on, uh, and affect uh, with help uh, the ability to sense and understand and do something about counter-narco, crime, illegal, unre unregulated, unreported fishing, uh, et cetera, in their economic zone. So we're working on that. And an ancillary benefit of, or a terrific benefit of broadband to everybody would be telehealth, teleeducation. Mm. A lot of goodness comes from that. So we're working on bringing private sector uh, to help ensure the, the best connectivity with the island states, and also uh, thinking through how the Department of Defense can help perhaps in aviation connect the islands. Some other initiatives uh, we are doing, uh, the Department of Defense, Indo-PACOM is terrific with education and training. So I coordinate that through Indo-PACOM, but we have the Asia Pacific Center for Security Studies in Honolulu. We have the Center for Excellence in Disaster Management in uh, Ford Island at, at Pearl Harbor. We have the East-West Center as part of the Department of State uh, on the University of Hawaii campus. These are all institutions that can help with training and education. And due to congressional funding, I just stood up Women, Peace and Security and Agenda uh, under, into, under my directorate. And I believe there's an overlap on disaster risk management and women, peace and security that I'm actually going to talk to Sherry after this about. <clears throat> also, if you remember, we're forward deployed. So we have a lot of ships and aircraft floating around um, the Indian Ocean and the Pacific, uh, the Western Pacific, all the time. So we, together with the Pacific Disaster Center, has a, um, a model that shows the weather conditions called disaster aware, 
we can watch the storms develop with the National Weather Service. We can position our assets that if asked to respond, we're in a good position to respond immediately. The Department of Defense is very good at disaster response, getting there quickly, saving lives, and getting out as quickly as they can. It's not our primary job, but we're there to help when, when we need to and when we're asked by the, the Department of State and the country through the ambassador to respond. Um, we also have DOD installations all over the world, so it's a global construct. We have bases and things throughout the world, but it's also very local. So we have tremendous infrastructure in Hawaii, and we can use that DOD infrastructure to invest in technologies that mitigate disaster risk and lower the risk uh, should a hurricane or something hit Hawaii. And we have these installations all over the world. I believe we can use the Department of Defense to really do some innovative things. And then that permeates out to the local community, whether it's a foreign nation or a state, uh, again, to help with the technological advancements and saying there's a business model uh, to do things that will mitigate risk. So I, I think there's great things to do as well there. Um, I think that's good, Jerry. That's that's great. That's <laughs> an enormous amount. And we're right at 11.30, so we t or 10.30, actually. Um, and now it's time to open the floor uh, for questions. And I know we have a lot of great talent here in the room, uh, some of the workshop participants from yesterday as well as others. Uh, so please, uh, we've got microphones uh, around the room. Raise your hand. And uh, we're delighted to engage you. Okay. Woman right there. And please introduce yourself. Hi, my name is Alex Hackbarth, and I'm with the American Security Project. And you've talked about great power competition and opportunities for cooperation. And given the U.S. retreat from leadership, global leadership on climate change with the re withdrawal recently of uh, Paris, can you um, expand more on where you see those opportunities for cooperation with China are to benefit you know, the, the globe, but also the Pacific Island nations? Okay, uh, Alex, I believe that question was, that arrow was pointed at me. So I'll go ahead and I'll, I'll take the arrow to the chest. So the Coast Guard, you know, we're probably, even though we were an armed service and, and have been since our inception of 1790, um, we often find ourselves as that instrument of soft power, if you will. Uh, since uh, 1998, uh, we have been the Coast Guard, a member of what's called the North Pacific Coast Guard Forum, um, which is comprised of the United States, Canada, Russia, China, Japan, South Korea. Um, and what we saw in this is that, so let's, let's look at the triad of, of China, Japan, Korea. Would they ever work together trilaterally? Um, and I'm here to tell you right now, in, in all likelihood, no. But when you throw the United States in the middle of that, you know, we can work multilaterally, and we do that with Russia as well. Uh, and we've done this in operations involving search and rescue, IUU enforcement, um, and there are actually treaties. Russia's, I mean, China is signatory to the moratorium against high sea drift net fishing. Which is, which is what led to this shipwriter agreement that we renew each and every year, and we continue to renew that. Another example I'll use is when I was working with the State Department uh, as we looked at an opening Arctic Ocean, um, and we didn't have a good governance model for it. I said, you know, we might want to look at Coast Guards being the governance model before we start moving carrier strike groups that are not ice capable, you know, into the high latitudes. Um, but at that point in time, among the Arctic Council nations, it says, uh, yes, but we don't want Russia there. Now, Russia's got a fleet of 40 icebreakers. Among all the Arctic Council nations combined, uh, they have more than four times the number of resources that can operate in the Arctic. So at that point in time, I had to get State Department permission to invite my four-star counterpart to Washington, D.C., so we could ink the deal and create this Arctic Coast Guard form. So just use these as different windows of opportunity, if you will, uh, where we can look at where we have, you know, commonalities um, that, that are on a global scale. And so if you really go back and look at, 
you know, the most disenfranchised nations when it comes to climate change are the least contributing members to climate change. Sub-Saharan Africa, you've got over 300 million potential refugees uh, that are facing food insecurity. Where are they going to go? Can you imagine the movement of 300 million people in today's environment where no one wants new people in their sovereign territories? We're getting a little weary of that. So uh, this is going to be the new normal, mm. uh, you know, not just in this region, but on a, on a global scale. Uh, and we need to get in front of this. And the, the way to do that is let's have a dialogue. Uh, how do we, get, you know, and so if you look at environmental refugees, um, I tend to stay out of the causality of climate change um, because in, in the Coast Guard we deal with the consequences, whether it was hurricanes, Harvey, Irma, Maria, uh, coastal flooding, uh, and, and the like. Um, but let's look at the consequences and then keep the narrative of causality out of it. Um, and the consequences really have human impacts. So if we can keep this in a humanitarian box, if you will, um, without any self-interest of, you know, if we are going to come under the compact, which we rightfully must do, um, but we can't do it alone, is how do we bring other partners along? And so I think that is where the dialogue has yet to happen, but we put this in a humanitarian crisis. You know, the, the, the thought of these islands, these nations disappearing when we have the means to do something about it. Not only the means, but we might even say some degree of responsibility. Uh, and, and I'll just uh, echo the President's sentiments. You know, if we stop greenhouse gases today, the sea's still going to rise. And I think most of you in this audience recognize the fact it takes about a century to metabolize the greenhouse gases that are already saturated in the atmosphere. Um, so the fuse has already been lit, and it's not going to go out. And in fact, you know, our emission levels continue to rise. Um, and even if we stop today, um, you know, this wave is on the horizon and it's going to come. And it has a humanitarian crisis. So, so that is where, you know, keep it humanitarian um, and as a consequence of, um, and not get into a dialogue of, of who emitted more greenhouse gas, me or you, and what, you know, what piece of that pie you know, do you have the bigger wedge because you were the least responsible? Yeah, you know, we can't correct yesterday's sins, uh, but we can certainly move forward and look at, you know, how do we prevent this catastrophe from taking place when we have the means to do so? Thanks, Alex. Okay. Uh, Ambassador? Uh, thank you, Sherry. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Stephen McGann. I was United States Ambassador to Fiji, Kiribati, Nauru, the Kingdom of Tonga, and Tuvalu from 2008 to 2011. And I appreciate Anote's kind remarks. Um, and Paul and I actually worked on shipwright agreements before he was Admiral Zimwal and I was Ambassador McGann. So uh, there's a lot of connectivity there. But the question I have uh, is two parts. Uh, one, we should also acknowledge that 2019 marks the 40th anniversary of the 1979 Treaty of Friendship between Kiribati mm -hmm. and the United States. And uh, one of the things that, uh, with Indo-PACOM's uh, help, uh, Anote and I built a steel and concrete bridge uh, <laughs> on Tarawa in 2010, uh, to connecting the two atolls. Uh, and, um, w but that also, is not just important because it was a creative use of humanitarian assistance uh, uh, and training funds, but it kind of speaks to a larger question that we have. Uh, and one of the questions that I have is directed directly to Anote. Can you expound a bit more on your relationship with Fiji and the purchase of land, ah. 20,000 acres, <laughs> and how that fits into your overall uh, uh, scheme for not necessarily movement, population movement, but support, but it also kicks into what's really important, I think, on the Indo-PACOM side, and that is before there's sea level rise, there's the danger of hurricanes, uh, tsunamis, and that uh, the humanitarian assistance disaster response portfolio may kick in even before sea level rise mm. is a problem. Mm. So in a sense, uh, the question goes to 
your movement to Fiji could actually be precipitated by a natural disaster and not sea level rise? And what is uh, Indo-PACOM doing in anticipation of the fact that earth earthquakes could cause tsunamis? Uh, we've seen uh, cyclones uh, with greater frequency and ferocity. I mean, can you imagine if we had a situation with the same cyclone mm -hmm. that hit Maputo, Mozambique this year, hitting uh, Suva? So anyway, that's my question. Thank you, um, Ambassador. Uh, uh, my directorate runs our ODACA account, which is the Overseas Humanitarian Assistance Disaster and Civic Aid, is the acronym for that. And Congress gives the OSD, who gives PACOM, about 25 to 35 million a year for this account. And this is what we build with, we build humanitarian assistance capacity and capability. So if you look at the, our ability to use the Army Corps of Engineers and, and, the, and the Navy Command to build things, you look at uh, Admiral Davidson's emphasis now on the Pacific Islands, so I've shifted my directorate's emphasis to really look at the Pacific Islands as well, even though the account is for the Indo-Pacific. And then, and, and I get back to that risk vulnerability model, if we can have a common model uh, in the DOD, a common model with our friends, allies, and partners to build the right capacity in the right place to affect the right outcome, um, I think we're, we're firing on all six cylinders when we do that uh, and coordinate those activities with Australia, New Zealand, the French, J Japanese, who are all involved in the Pacific Islands to build the right capacity. For instance, we just completed a risk vulnerability model of Vietnam uh, and uh, worked with the Vietnamese on that. Uh, you can use the Pacific Disaster Center's disaster aware to, to look at a storm heading into Vietnam and do predictive modeling. If the storm should drop this amount of rain per hour in this region, you would have this percentage chance of landslides <clears throat> that could affect a large population. In the past, if I was going to build or work with Vietnam to bring uh, heavy equipment in to help in such a situation and put them in a warehouse under this account, this risk vulnerability model would tell me exactly where to put that and to work with the Vietnamese on the right place to put that type of capacity and capability. And if Japan was also doing work in Vietnam or Australia or one of our other friends, allies and partners, India, um, we could coordinate with them and make sure we're all not doing the same thing in different places. So that's one way that Indo-PACOM can help the Pacific Islands and the Indo-Pacific with some of these accounts to build this capacity and capability. And you couple that with our disaster response capability. Remember, it's not our primary mission, but we are there and we can help. I think that's a powerful tool. And Ambassador, I'll just tag on to that. So we have what's called a, a natural response framework. Uh, that, that brings in whole of government and assigns areas of responsibility. But what you described is, is a logistics nightmare uh, of, of how do you evacuate and then resettle in the wake of or in anticipation of a significant disaster. Uh, it's not widely known, but you know, on any given day, the, the Coast Guard has over 1,500 <coughs> uh, commercial ships that are involved in international trade uh, that participate in a program uh, where if there's a disaster, uh, they will divert from track and render assistance to mariners in distress. Uh, there is a possibility we'd be able to leverage this fleet of, it won't be 1,500 because this is worldwide, um, but in proximity to, uh, that would be able to help facilitate, you know, a, 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 an evacuation of that magnitude. Uh, I've taken a ship to Kwajalein uh, from Hawaii. Um, and, and the crew is, it, it's like the kids in the back seat. Are we there yet? There's a lot of open ocean uh, between where our fleets are home ported and to where this disaster is located. And um, so how do you marshal, you know, a logistic effort of that magnitude? Uh, let's not discount the commercial fleet that ply these waters as well. If I can add also to that question, I think you raised a number of questions, Steve. Um, let me first of all touch on the Treaty of Friendship, um, which was signed in uh, 1979. And that was at the same time we, we achieved independence from the United Kingdom. And I think the Treaty of Friendship is basically a security treaty, if I might say so. Because I think it's a recognition by the United States that 
We are one of the few Pacific Island countries that share a border with, border with the United States. And um, of course, we were also part of the um, world, Second World War. And one of the biggest battles was fought on, uh, on Tarawa, the Battle of Tarawa. And uh, I was looking for an article because I saw it this morning that one of the, uh, the, uh, the, 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 the soldiers uh, was, uh, the, the remains of one of the soldiers was just found uh, recently and returned to somewhere in the United States. But we keep doing this, we keep finding remains of um, soldiers of the United States. And, uh, and so our link with the United States in terms of strategic security issues is, is something that's so close. And uh, for example, when I changed relations from, uh, to Taiwan in 2003, it was also, the part of the reason was because we were being sucked again into this issue. When China built a, uh, a, 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 a satellite, not a satellite, I think a ro rocket tracking station in Tarawa, close by where the United States were doing their tests in Kwajalein. Mm -hmm. And so that was sensitive, and we re really don't want to be a part of this. Now imagine if um, now that we have relations with China, and they built an island, okay, because we are looking for islands. And if China offers to build the islands, we might say yes. And if they offer to do that in, um, in Christmas Island, which is two hours from, from Hawaii, and we couldn't pay back the loan, of course, they would take it over. And we don't have the means to resist. What would be the security implications for the United States? With respect to the point that um, you raised also, Steve, the, 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 what I did, and I think I did a lot of crazy things during my time because I was trying to deal with this issue which I, uh, to which I had no answer. And so one of the things was closing off the uh, Phoenix Island's protected area. It was uh, part of the conservation movement. But it was also about telling the world that we have a crisis and we, we, I was calling for uh, sacrifice to be made, com commitments. And so we did that. But also I, what I did was to buy land in Fiji. Okay? And uh, I've never said ever that we were going to move our people to Fiji because at the time I was scared of the Fijians. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and I was quite often asked by the media, why did you buy land? Are you moving your people? I said, no, it's an investment. And uh, of course it is an investment, but it is a safety net for the future. And when, I, I, when I've been asked over and over again, I say, no, I'm not doing it. And I was not lying because if there is any um, movement of people, it won't be by me. But uh, I think it's there as also a part of the, this allowed statement to the international community that this is serious. If you're not going to do anything for us, we will try to do, it, do as much on our own as we can. And so the land is there. And um, it continues to be a question by the Fijians. Why did they, the, the, the people, the, the government of Kiribati buy land? Are they taking over Fiji? But it was actually debated in parliament in, in Fiji. But the one thing that was so wonderful was that Fiji, the Fiji government has since come out and said, if ever the people of Kiribati and Tuvalu should need somewhere to go due to climate change impacts, Fiji would be ready and willing to accommodate them. Now, no other country has ever come forward, stepped forward to say that. And all the time that I've been speaking, I've been challenging every looking in the face and making my comments, but nobody would come forward and say, we would take your people in. Now, that was something that was, I think, it's a, it's a, for Fiji, it's a step forward when nobody else would step forward. And so, still, I bought the land just to tell everybody, including the United States, that we have a problem and nobody, a problem not of our making but nobody is stepping forward yet to help. Thank you. Well, Ms. Mr. President, you said you did a number of crazy things. I think we would call that leadership. <laughs> uh, yes, okay, these two, two questions here, and then we'll go to the side. Hi, thank you. Uh, uh, fantastic presentation and discussion. Um, Chris Meyer, Chief Operations Officer with World Hope International. Most recently, um, Commander Meyer, U.S. Navy, former 7th Fleet Planner, and with the U.S. Southcom J-9, so it's good to see you again, Dr. Wood. Yeah, good to see you. Um, 
we do a lot of uh, my current organization, World Hope, does a lot of uh, climate resilience programming around the world and disaster response and relief. Mm. So as we talk about the international development space, who's going to be programmed? I said uh, to to try to uh, to try to uh, def defer and delay a lot of these issues, which will ultimately um, come, as President Tong mentioned. Uh, at least as far as U.S. government development programming, my question is, should it matter who implements? Uh, because the development space is competitive, right? So as we see in many Pacific Island nations, the Chinese are coming with deep pockets as well, trying to gain their influence, as is the U.S. government. Um, as we, the U.S. taxpayer, funds uh, implementers, you know, should it matter if it's an international organization or a U.S. organization? Should there be a by U.S to quote a, a sales pitch, uh, you know, element to that. Um, folks who are perhaps more aware of the national security impl uh, implications. Uh, I'll, I'll take a stab at that first, Chris, and I'm sure uh, the president and John have a comment on that as well. Uh, but let's, I mean, we just need to come to grips with reality. Um, you know, our deficit spending is the legacy that we will leave for two generations, if not more to come. Um, and we have bills that have yet to be paid. Um, and if you start looking at an aging population, health care cost, you know, have we seen, you know, the high water mark of a $750 billion discretionary appropriation of the Department of Defense as they're trying to recapitalize assets at the same time? And, and the answer to the question is, you know, we will not be able to pay all of these bills without driving ourselves deeper into debt. Um, and so we need to look collectively you know, at some of these global, and this is a, a global issue, and then look for opportunities with the two largest economies on the face of the earth right now, the United States and China, uh, which gets back to this, you know, can we take a step back, breathe through our nose, and, and look at, well, wait a minute, you know, can we have peer cooperation and not everything becomes competition? Again, <clears throat> under the guise of, you know, this is a, a humanitarian crisis. Um, and let's face it, this is a, a crisis. Uh, the challenge we face, it's not a crisis now. Um, and it's this very same dialogue I have with, 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 you know, with various groups, and they want to know when is the sea level going to rise that extra meter. And if it's not going to happen until 2100, then, then why do I care today? And so that, unfortunately, is the conundrum we find ourselves in today. You know, we wait till the crisis, um, and then we respond. Uh, but in this case, you know, we're going to be late to need. Um, so we need to at least have this dialogue. And so where does it begin? You know, I mean, as I alluded to earlier, you know, as we look at the renewal of the compacts, uh, we don't have a national strategy, if you will, for this region. Indo-PACOM has one, um, but as I call it, it's, it's the tail trying to wag the dog. Um, we didn't have one for the Arctic going, you know, a, a ways back. And as I was looking at, an ocean is now opening up. Um, we had a national security presidential directive under uh, Bush 43, and it laid out a number of tasks, um, but this was during the Obama administration as well. That was the last president, and, you know, this is a new administration. Um, as I shared with the group yesterday, I was, you know, every four months they bring in the service chiefs. We brief the president, and I usually get the cheap seat, and then the uh, Chairman says, oh, you haven't heard from the Commandant, and then the Commandant of the Marine Corps speaks up. He says, no, no, I mean the other Commandant, the Coast Guard. <laughs> um, and so I mentioned the Arctic, and President Obama stopped me mid-sentence. says, why is only the Coast Guard is paying attention to what's going on in the Arctic? He actually went up to the Arctic, the first president to do so. Then they roll out a national strategy for the Arctic region, and by that time, then I could roll out my, I, said, I just happen to have one on the shelf um, that aligns with our national directive. Um, but unfortunately, you know, these become political tools, not truly en enduring strategies that those of us, and as you know, Chris, you know, we spent a lot of time planning, building those assumptions, and, and these plans are fine-tuned over time, yet a lot of these become shelfware. We have a change of administration from one to the other. So what we need to do is we ha need to have that principals committee meeting, uh, meeting to say, hey, these are going to expire. Let's bring in all the smart people. Um, let's put a strategy together. And then let's come up with an implementation plan. Um, and the last time we did that, and we did that over multiple administrations, when JFK said, we're going to put a man on the moon. I mean, he said, that's a, that's a crazy president. Uh, we did it in 1968. 
uh, with overlapping administrations. Uh, but I think that's where we need to, you know, a starting point, if you will, but we're not there yet, which is why we need to have these very frank, candid discussions um, to start moving this, as I say, awareness into action. If I uh, can, uh, President Tong very clearly articulated the threat to the Pacific Islands, uh, the existential threat to the Pacific Islands. And the question uh, from Chris is a good one, and that how, how can we affect change? Roger and Sherry yesterday drove the entire day to try to get to actions, because workshops are only so good unless you have an action plan that comes out from it, and it was one of the better workshops I've been in because of that drive. From the Department of Defense, security, there's an overlap with security in the U.S. government on this issue but we would say we're a very small piece of the puzzle. But as Admiral Z said, the Department of Defense does have some resources and we do have things out in the Pacific that can help. So the key in the U.S. government perspective is, I believe, to rally around this free and open Indo-Pacific, which brings all the government agencies together, overlap security with USAID development, with uh, uh, the Department of State's diplomatic mandate, Treasury's mandate to bring the World Bank and Asian Development Bank and the financial instruments into the region, find all those overlapping areas, and work with our friends, allies, and partners and our NGOs, which Chris represents one of them, and try to do the right things at the right time to uh, affect change. Again, defense, a very small piece of this puzzle, uh, but we're working the best we can. Thank you. I think we have question there. Hi, uh, my name is Bridget Moore and I am a PhD candidate at the School of Conflict Analysis and Resolution at George Mason University. Um, so first of all, I'll thank President Tong. Um, your, your crazy things that you did have led me to my dissertation topic, so I thank you for that. <laughs> Glad to hear um, so I think we all agree that sort of the human issue is uh, the most important issue with climate change. Uh, but given that we are a community of states, the international community is a community of states, I'm really focused on what is going to happen with states themselves uh, in relation to <coughs> climate change. Um, a couple of things have been mentioned, from EEZs to building islands uh, as ways to maintain some form of sovereignty in the future. But I'm wondering, uh, President Tong, are there any other ways that you can imagine Kiribati maintaining some form of sovereignty in the future? Thank you. Well, th thank you for that question. It's uh, quite frankly, it's a question that I've never been able to answer because we haven't got to that stage yet. But I can assure you that I've been asked that question many times, especially by researchers and students like yourself who are trying to find the solution for us. For us, um, we don't see ourselves, and I think you will hear this over and over again from the leaders in, from within the region, that uh, I think you will hear cries like, uh, we are not sinking, we are fighting, okay? I understand that. It's an emotional response, and I, uh, part of what I've been advocating has been rejected by the current government, but I think they misunderstand what it was that I've been saying. What I've been saying is, is we will, as far as possible, try to maintain our, uh, our nationhood. Because the last thing we ever want to do is to lose what it is that is us, okay? And without a country, it's going to be difficult to remain uh, as a people and as a nation, uh, as a distinct people. And so that's been the, uh, the, the first line. But eventually, if all of that fails, we must have a, a fallback option. And this is what I had, I've been advocating, um, migration with dignity, okay? And the question then is, when we, if and when we do migrate, how do we migrate? We get dispersed all over the different parts of the world, or do we migrate as a people and as a nation to, to reestablish our nation somewhere else? Maybe here in the United States, in Australia. In Australia, they've got a huge country, but they would not, they, they make it so difficult to go there. <laughs> but, uh, you know, that, these are the questions. Do you, how do you retain your culture? Would you be able to do that? And quite frankly, I, I, w I know what I would like to say, and my answer would be yes, we'd love to do that. How to do that is going to be difficult. And I don't know that it's going to be possible. I, I believe that one day a lot of countries would lose their sovereignty. And the question is, 
where do they go? Uh, and I think it's already happening to some degree. I think uh, what's happening in, in Europe, in Europe is, is part of the process of this mass migration. They, these people who go to Europe do not go and bring their country with them. They leave it behind. And, uh, and so I suspect that that is what we will end up doing, okay? Um, I don't think the world is yet ready to allow something like what you're perhaps suggesting to happen. If anything, many countries are already tightening up their, tightening up their borders. Here in the United States, Australia, and many other countries are doing this. And so I watched this with a lot of interest and a great deal of trepidation because I can see this happening to our, our people in the future. And I can see, um, I, I, I wonder sometimes, and I've, I've drawn the analogy to um, the, the, the Titanic, and I'm misquoted quite often. When I refer to the Titanic, I think about people swimming in the water and those on the boats. And uh, the question is, those on the boat, are they the boats? Are they going to pull these people from the sea, even if it might endanger them? And the question applies to our people. Will they be welcomed or pushed away? So the answer, uh, hopefully you will find the answer in your thesis, okay? I look forward to seeing <laughs> Thank you. Well, that, oh my goodness. Um, all right, I have to, uh, well, I see two more hands, but I have to ask Lauren for guidance here since we are at the closing time. Um, okay, all right. <laughs> We'll, we'll take the two the two last hands I see together, uh, and then we will we will um, close it close it out um, on this very uh, humbling and uh, important discussion. Okay, woman here in the front, and then woman in the back. I just have one sentence. This is something that I've been working on. Can you introduce for a yourself, year. please? And it says. The United States must soon create a new entity to remove enough carbon dioxide already up in the atmosphere, which is now internationally known as the only way to prevent ongoing extreme world damages. And I have worked on this, and there are a lot of people, including um, the IPCC, the International Panel of climate change last year, this time last year, this was one of the things that they were also saying, that it's not just that we can prevent <clears throat> putting out any more CO2, it's already too late. We have to get a good government entity within the next couple of years to remove enough of the CO2 that's already up in the air. And our government can figure out how to do that well, and there are di different ways of doing it. There are a lot of entities now that are doing it different ways, but we would have to be able to Thank do the you. whole thing. Thank you. And We're going to have to take I, one, I just more, want to say one question. more thing. Once we figure out how to do that correctly, people might still be able to use CO2 going forward, and everybody can be, unlike many other worlds, on the same side. So Thank that's you. that's just me. Sorry. <laughs> and the last question here in the back. Hello. Good morning, everybody. I'm Annie Kayaban Wilderman, born Filipino. Ah. I am founder and CEO of Semi Ace. From my Navy experience, it is collaborative engagements on matters of mutual interest, agents of change empowered. I am a student of the Wilson Center because my lifelong PhD is how to bridge the gap from what the Admiral is saying, from the bottom up. And my question also is, what price tag do we put on the human factor that, are, that is affected by the security risk that we are talking about? And uh, how do we measure it? You know, because I am off the ground, and a lot of people are saying, you know, all you from Washington talking about La La Land. While we are here, poor, dying, with the weather changes that we don't have any control of. Okay, thank you. Since we are at our um, closing hour, and those two questions 
I think could take us into a whole nother seminar and a whole nother discussion. <laughs> and we've had very stirring comments. Um, un unless there's any compelling last minute thoughts, I have a comment on which I'd like to close us out. But um, uh, President Tong so, so um, vividly and shared with us um, you know, the, the world that we live that is changing today. And it, it makes me, you know, reflect back. We all have our own, you know, personal stories. And my parents fled the Holocaust uh, in another era. Um, and they were fortunate to have been welcomed into this country. Um, and as we now live in the era of the greatest migration since World War II, um, you know, when we, we want a, f a free and open Pacific, uh, we, we want our own nation here, um, like the Statue of Liberty, to be the place uh, that, that uh, welcomes those uh, with open arms and understands and reflects the humanity um, that we have, that, that stands for who we are as Americans. And that has been deeply reflected uh, today in the, the compassion and the need uh, that President Tong shared with us. And as we work in this uh, small piece of the project of, of the, the sort of global enterprise to try to advance um, our understanding of the Cascadian compound risk we face, but also improving our, our predictive capabilities to uh, be able to better handle them and build resilience. I want to thank uh, all of you for being here today. I want to thank our, our partners at NOAA and UCAR for the team here, and most importantly, President Tong, Admiral Z, and Dr. John Wood. A round of applause.